Welcome to the Risk and Repeat podcast, episode number 232. I'm Rob Wright, Security News Director at Tech Target, and I am here with Senior Security News Writer Alex Kalafi and Security News Writer Ariel Waldman. Hello, guys. Hi. Hi, Rob. How are you guys doing today? Yeah, pretty, no well, pretty well. Pretty <laughs> well. Guys, I got to be honest, I'm doing great. The Celtics won the NBA championship, yeah. the 18th <laughs> NBA championship. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm running a little low on sleep right now uh, and a lot of coffee. Uh, we are recording this, I should note, on June 18th, uh, the morning of June 18th. It's going to be an extremely hot Tuesday. Uh, yes. But yeah. I'm pretty I'm pretty happy. I don't think that there's anything that can really get me down right now, although we're probably going to try uh as we discuss this uh this this big picture topic. I, I guess two-pronged uh story regarding Microsoft. Uh we've talked about Microsoft quite a bit lately uh on a number of fronts. Breaches, CSRB report, SFI initiative, the Secure Future initiative to overhaul security and improve it. Uh, Ariel, you have written about Microsoft's uh, recall feature and the controversy around that and how that has unfolded over the last several weeks. Um, why don't you, you wrote about this for, for Tech Target Security. Tell us a little bit about what is going on with Recall. What is Recall? Let's start there. Recall is an AI feature for Microsoft's new Copilot Plus PCs that was supposed to launch today, actually. <laughs> but it has gotten pushed back, which we can get to later. Mm -hmm. It will not be launching today um, because of said controversies. Um, yeah, there's pretty much no one else in the industry is in for recall except for Microsoft, it sounds like. I haven't heard any positives for it. Um, basically, it's a tool that takes screenshots of users' work every five seconds, and then it keeps analysis of those screenshots. So it's intended for people to go back and kind of view content that they've previously viewed, um, but it's been getting a ton of backlash for all the security shortcomings. Uh, Brian Reed from Proofpoint said it was a info stealer disguised at a, as a productivity feature. Uh, it's been called an info stealer. It's not great. Times. No, spyware they've been referring to it as. Another person I talked with said it was one of the greatest violations of privacy um, pretty much ever. Um, so the feedback has been pretty awful. Um, and Microsoft... They did respond. Initially, the feature was enabled by default, so you had to opt out of it. Mm. Um, they did eventually change that because of all the backlash, so now it's disabled by default, but security professionals still said there's just not enough security around um, around the product to, for it to be beneficial or safe for users. Um, another problem was that they, a lot of uh, InfoSec experts were saying that they don't even really know what it could be used for for the average user, like how useful it would be to them. Maybe more like security professionals or like SOC teams, but um, as far as the average user, there's not that many great options for using it. Um, so that was also part of the controversy. It's kind of, what is this even gonna be used for? <laughs> yeah. I, I think an, uh, an interesting other part of this story is that Microsoft did say that like all this stuff would be stored locally. It wouldn't be going to yeah. uh, an additional server, all this like recording that, would have, that it would be doing. But I think that also adds like a subtext to the story of, okay, maybe factually on paper as Microsoft describes it, they're not storing all this data that it's taking into a server and then using it to train its own models. However, uh, has anything Microsoft done from a security perspective earned even a lick of trust that that's how it's going to play out? And, and was, I would argue probably not. That's what some, uh, Brian Reed also brought that point up when I was speaking to him and he said that Microsoft's saying that for now, but in the future, like maybe that could change with a product update to Windows 11 or 
he said Microsoft's kind of known for doing that. And he's like, that's not, you know, out of breath for them to to just change something like that. So that, yeah, mm-hmm. it's a good point, Alex. Yeah, it, it, it seems like, and so the, the listeners uh, can't, can't see the expressions that I've been making over the last whatever couple of minutes that we've been, as you've been describing in the comments that you got, Ariel, and and just sort of the criticisms of this feature. Uh, but I've been doing a lot of um, side eye and and just like cringe and, uh, and stuff my daughter gives to me on a, on, on a daily basis now that she's a, a tween, but uh, that's neither here nor there. Uh, yeah, I mean, let's, Let's just start with, you know, your point about nobody really knows what this feature, like why it was built, like what it was supposed to be. I mean, when I remember when this was first released, it came under like immediate criticism from the experts, from the, the you know, the infosec types out there who write a lot about vulnerabilities and, you know, threat, uh, you know, attack surfaces and potential threats. And, and this just came under fire immediately, so much so that I thought, well, maybe people are going a little bit overboard. Um, but it certainly doesn't seem like that. It seems like everybody, every third party security professional out there that took a good look at this was just like, what are, you know, what is Microsoft doing? And I, I don't understand what the feature was for. You know, to your point about Ariel about the average user, I mean, unless it's you're like the guy in the movie Memento and you're forgetting everything every like 20, 30 minutes or something, and you need recall to like inform you of the stuff that you just saw on, on the web, like the pages that you just visited. I, I don't know. I, I'm not really sure what it's for. And then it's creating a huge attack surface that. I, I, it's just, I, I know they added protections around the data and they, if memory serves, um, Ariel, you had written about the update that they made uh, more than a week ago where they said, you know, we're going to add an extra layer of authentication. We're going to encrypt the data. Mm-hmm. I mean, shouldn't that have been done already? That's what a lot of people are saying. And another issue is that, um, they didn't really address the fact that it can it takes pictures of passwords and like bank statement or bank account numbers and things like that. I don't think any of the updates address really that, which obviously is a big issue as well. And Microsoft kind of, you know, did the fine print there saying that those could be exposed and it doesn't moderate for any content. So it just takes screenshots of anything. Really. Yeah. They, none of the updates really seem to address. Right. So it's not redacting anything that like you really wouldn't need to know because it's already stored in your computer, which is just bizarre. Like it's really exposing stuff that does not need, that the average user would not need to remember. Like why would it take pictures of stuff in like your password manager? I, I, right. It's really it's bizarre. Like Microsoft was like spoofing us with this one. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. Why do you, do you think they developed this? Was are, are we just on such an AI high right now that even a company like Microsoft that has been doing this a very long time and is just a, a, a titan, a, you know, a, a pillar of of modern information technology, a lot of experience, a lot of smart people. Are we just like high on our own AI supply at this point and just like mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. No. It's it's not like maybe. It's yeah. it's it feels like AI at a business level has become a little bit cultish. I think in a more practical sense, Microsoft has invest how invested how many billions into OpenAI. They need to do whatever they can to get a return on that money and soon, or else it's going to look really really bad. <laughs> um, and also, it it is like. How many companies? I mean, we Ariel and I were at RSA, but um, I'm sure you even saw it at AWS from from various vendors there. Yes, everyone's high on the a- AI <laughs> supply. Like everyone is, right? Yeah. That's will... what Gabe um, Newt said to me yeah. as well. Um, he's an analyst, and yeah, he was saying like Microsoft and many other vendors are just trying to kind of throw out these AI capabilities into their products and. 
but he said they look before they let leap. So yeah. yeah, definitely. Seems like consensus. I, I will note you, Alex, you mentioned AWS. So I was at, at, at Reinforce in Philadelphia la- last week. Sorry, the, the whole last week, ever since the Celtics got into the finals, I, <laughs> it's been a blur. I've been a, a, a ball of um, anxiety and just lack of sleep and, and just nervousness. And um, it was worth so, it. Yeah, it was worth it. I mean, yeah, I feel great now, um, even though I slept like two hours. Uh, no, I, 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 I went to that show kind of expecting to hear a lot about AI, and I did. But one thing, and I've told you guys this, we had discussions about this. You know, I talked with a number of executives there who really expressed um, a a cautious uh, viewpoint. Uh, or approach or or philosophy about AI, especially as it pertains to AWS and Amazon itself deploying um, third-party AI. They were ve- like w- their basic approach is if they're working with that, if they have third-party tech products or services, and the vendor comes to them and says, "Hey, we're turning on AI, we're infusing AI in this new product," their standard approaches to say please don't do that we want to we we have to vet this we have to look at what type of data you're using what type of service this is at like down the line everything you know what type of security risks this may entail um are you using our data to train a model are you using are you anonymizing the data all these questions so they're, they're very 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 careful about how this stuff is um is is being deployed again third party products i mean i'm sure it's a, a a different case i'm sure they want customers to deploy their products um but they're very cautious with this stuff from a third party perspective and and i guess rightfully so uh so i i think yeah to your point alex i think people are high on the ai stuff it's just like man we are really just throwing this stuff out there and for Microsoft to release this feature again, it didn't feel like anybody was asking for something like this. You know, I, I just thought Copilot. You know, maybe we'd get like a like an AI version of um, Clippy. You know, they remember the 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 Clippy Microsoft Office, like the little helper. Yeah. We get an no, AI more version. helpful than yeah. anything <laughs> Microsoft has done after. Ouch. Um, <laughs> No, we, we'd get something like that or we'd get other sort of add-on features or or um, AI chatbot assistance or specialized, like really uh, ultra-specialized assistance. But this whole thing of like just screenshotting stuff, which seems so bizarre to me. And the fact that Microsoft had, has been under fire so much in the wake of Storm 558, Midnight Blizzard breaches, CSRB report, and you know they announced the Secure Future in- Initiative last year. They had to announce it again, like an expansion, like during RSA. They've been under so much fire, and for them to be like a few weeks later, hey, we're releasing this feature, and um, it's going to take screenshots. <laughs> of your mm-hmm. of your desktop and and it's like you just got the feeling like you said ariel in your in your story the folks that you talked to it's like what were they thinking like how did this how did this especially during this time no one at that company just kind of said hold on a minute um this doesn't mesh with sfi this doesn't mesh with security first this doesn't you know maybe this is maybe the criticism is getting a little overblown but we shouldn't release this now. Like no one at the company said that. No one. No. And they had to wait until all of this, you know, this chorus of booze and criticism and and just flack that they were taking backed them into a corner for them to say, okay, here, we're going to add these new security features. And then lo and behold, as you wrote in your story, they had to, Push it back. So, what's the story there, Ariel? What's the what? Oh, what yeah. Have... <laughs> well, during the um, the testimony with the Department of Homeland Security last week, um, right after that, um, 
Microsoft announced that they were going to push, they well, now it's pushed back indefinitely pretty much. And it's not going to preview for Copilot plus PCs anymore. It's going to preview with the Windows, um, oh, the Windows program, Windows Insider program, um, which they describe as Microsoft's biggest fan. So I thought that was kind of ironic. Like, sure. That those would be the ones that were testing out this thing that received all this criticism. Yeah. Um, so now, yeah, so last week, so now it, we're not sure when it's going to preview, um, when it's going to be available for preview. So kind of, yeah, pushed back indefinitely for now. It's like coming weeks uh, specifically, but that's yeah. yeah, not super clear. So let, let's say, let's say they release this however many weeks or months down the road. Mm -hmm. Um and it's not, it doesn't end up being the security disaster that we think, but, you know, people don't turn on. There's no attacks tied to it. Do you guys still, like, do you think that this is still going to be seen as a major fumble on Microsoft's part? Mm, well, the the sad, cynical answer is uh, <laughs> if you take some bad news, wait long enough and make it slightly less bad. Uh, after the initial negative wave came out, people other than us aren't really going to care. Yeah, <laughs> that's what the analyst I was talking to said. Like, like we, like the industry cares, but he wants there. It's kind of still to be determined, like how much users will care. The average user might notice or care that yeah. about all the security shortcomings. But I think it's still. I mean, I think it'll still make people think about it, even if it comes out and there's no tax tied to it. Right. Like it's still brought up good discussions about security and all these issues. Um, yeah. And but. actually to, to jump in a little bit, that's actually a good question, Rob, given that they're making the feature opt in now. Um, yeah. So I think we could also see a situation where it's not installed on a lot of devices because not a lot of people are going to want that. But if you own a Windows computer in, like, your personal life, about every month or two, every time you turn it on to do whatever, like, the big flagship updates are, um, they'll give you, like, this blue screen that says, hey, do you want an improved web browsing experience? And then it's just, like, trying to get you to switch all of your stuff to Edge. No. Um, and Bing and whatever. And, oh, do you want to pay for a cloud Microsoft office. No, I'm all set with Google. Thank you. And I bet it's going to become another slide oh. on that. Uh, on that. On yeah. yeah. I, that's my fear too, is that people are, are going to, like, I, I know the InfoSec, it. yeah, the InfoSec and the tech types out there, they're familiar with what this is and, and the criticisms around it. But I, mean, I don't know if like my in-laws, uh, you know, I, I just, I envision a call, a panicked call, uh, down the road where they're just like, um, what, you know, I, I opted into this feature and it's doing this and, you know, help me and, uh, we'll see, we'll see. I kind of feel like Microsoft, maybe it won't end up even hitting the market. Like they'll pull it back or like they'll change more aspects before it goes in the preview, I don't know. I think they'll definitely happen. release it. Yeah, I mean, it seems like they've done so much still work. Be released. Yeah, That's maybe you're right. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not pull right. it, but yeah, I don't know. Uh, what are they well, waiting for now? If they pushed it back again? Well, I, I think I think I have an answer to that. Question. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> and I think it's the next part of this story. Great, great transition setup. Um, that was like an alley you, Ariel. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Uh, so you had mentioned the testimony, uh, Brad Smith, Microsoft president spoke before what, what was it? It was a DHS, uh, yep. Uh, it was the Homeland security right. committee. committee. Yep. Um, and it was a hearing titled a cascade of security failures, assessing Microsoft corporation, cyber security shortfalls and the implications for, uh, Homeland Security, which was sort of uh, intended as the big uh, mea culpa or interrogation of yeah. uh, Microsoft President Brad Smith 
following the Cyber Safety Review Board report, which sort of put Microsoft at major fault for the Storm 558 Chinese nation state uh, breach it suffered last year. Yeah, I mean, the title alone kind of really, um, that's not what you want. Tongue twister. Yeah, it, uh, also <laughs> very long. Um, well done, Alex. But Thanks. goodness gracious, not a great look going in to a hearing like that. But like, okay, so let's let's break it down. What did Brad Smith say? What kind of questions did he get? What were the highlights or lowlights? And then we can kind of get into how this may have impacted or affected recall uh, and, and the future of that product or feature. I would say 40 to 50% of the questions over the three hour hearing were about the stuff you would expect Congress people to ask, um, but aren't necessarily so relevant to what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Or or rather, they're like the Microsoft still does business with the, the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, can you comment on this? That, that was like <laughs> that was like half the questions was so, was not really. Oh it was half and it was just um so there was some of that, but then there was also uh, some questions about Microsoft's uh, efforts to prioritize security. There was some questions about recall. Um, and then folks brought up um, the uh, Russian nation state uh, attack from Midnight Blizzard that Microsoft suffered earlier this year. Okay, so the some of the big points, there was the written testimony Brad Smith had where I don't think he read it out loud. I think one of the Congress members did. Oh, um, okay. but Or I don't know. I, I forget, but I didn't, I, I think it was like a little bit separated. Mm. But in any case, there was a written testimony where Smith said Microsoft accepted responsibility for uh, everything in the CSRB report uh, without equivocation, hesitation, or defensiveness. Um, mm, a little bit of defensiveness, but yeah, okay. <laughs> I would see a medium amount of defensiveness, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, but he also said that they're addressing all of the CSRB's like 16 recommendations. He did a he did apologize and expressed regret. Um, I think he actually used the word "I apologize," which is good because <laughs> a lot of companies don't do that, right? Um, so pretty nice written. Um, statement which did take responsibility um as for when he was actually asked questions i would say the overall tone was corporate mm. um defensive with a smile maybe mm -hmm. is sort of mm -hmm. the the way i would sort of put it where um he was asked about a pro publica article uh, published last week in which a former employee, Andrew Harris, said Microsoft uh, dismissed warnings of a critical flaw uh, because it would have massive financial con consequences, allegedly. Um, this involved, And then a Russian state-sponsored hacker used the flaw, which was called Golden Samuel, uh, during the SolarWinds attacks to further compromise criminal organizations including allegedly the National Nuclear Security Administration. Right. Customer organizations. But I mean, I, I who knows? You could, I suppose you could call the nuclear agency a criminal organization, depending on your disposition. But yes. Yeah. Smith is uh, Smith basically declined to comment say, because he had not read the article, which mm -hmm. to me felt like the easy way out. Because, yeah. I, yeah. well, Definitely. I've watched enough. All three of us have watched enough like Netflix crime documentaries <laughs> to see the archival uh, interrogation footage right. where like one of these histories monsters is like, I'm not familiar with that. I'm not familiar with that. I'm not I familiar. With this. <laughs> uh, yeah. Or, or they're just claiming ignorance, which I'm Brad Smith isn't that bad, but, but it's the same. It was the same energy he was bringing to it. Yeah. Um, and one of my favorite moments was uh, Representative Clay Higgins, who's the uh, who's a congressperson, congressman from uh, Louisiana. He asked him about the MSA key that was used in the Storm 558 attack last year. Um, Microsoft initially said in a September blog post that the MSA key was incorrectly included in a crash dump and Storm 558 obtained a Microsoft engineer's credentials to access a debugging environment containing the key. 
But the CSRB investigation, however, found that Microsoft had no evidence of logs, no evidence or logs showing the stolen keys presence in or exfiltration from a crash dump, basically meaning that Microsoft did not actually know where this MSA key originated. But this was not reflected until six months later on March 12th. Higgins asked Smith about this. Um, why did it take you six months to uh, update this external facing and for this external facing disclosure that um, basically now says you don't really know what happened? And mm -hmm. then Smith told him that it's a question that I asked the team when I read the CSRB report because it's the part of the report that surprised me the most. Um, I I. I know he's a busy person as the president of Microsoft, but when your company gets breached, I feel like this is a piece of information he should know within the year, the the nine months um, leading up to the CSRB reports release. Yeah, He's a busy guy. He might not know it right away, but within nine months, he should have some idea about how this key was And I'm going in front of the hearing, the hearing too. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, basically, Smith ultimately said that um, we had five versions of that original blog and four updates. And basically, it came down to this information wouldn't have been actionable for a customer. And that's why I didn't include it. Higgins, who is who's normally a person I would say I, I disagree with on a lot mm -hmm. of issues. Mm -hmm. Um said like respectfully that answer does not encourage trust and that uh i don't accept that answer um because you're basically saying that because a corporate customer shouldn't take action it wouldn't be able to take action on this that's why you didn't include any additional information for six months um and then smith added i said the same thing and we had the same conversation inside the company and that i would say is a microcosm of brad smith's tone for a lot of it which is basically saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, we're doing better, we're doing better, we're going to do better, but ultimately not really saying, there wasn't a lot of substance in his words beyond right. the t responsibility taking. And I don't know if if Rob or, or Ariel, either of you had a similar reaction. I, I, I mean, <clears throat> I... My reaction to watching some of it and then reading, you know, the opening testimony, but but particularly I zeroed in on that exchange with with uh, Congressman Higgins, and I just like you you hear so much about sort of the lack of transparency from other companies, whether it's CrowdStrike or Tenable or other folks out there who have been beating up Microsoft for a while now and saying they've lost their way in security. Well, when you hear that response. You're just kind of like, so if, if a if a customer doesn't have to do a take a specific action to protect themselves, they're not entitled to the information. They're not entitled to a correct public record about a major breach that may not have affected them directly, but is certainly pertinent to the company's standing and the trust that it, the the rest of the customer base puts in that company. I just found that remarkable. Like I, you just, I heard that. And I'm like, they don't get it. Like they, the SFI thing. Sure. I understand what they're trying to do there, but man, they've got a lot of work to do. If they can't, if they can't understand how that important, that information was that you don't actually know how the MS key was compromised. And then for, for, you know, the, the, the questions about, Oh, I didn't. I didn't know about this, and I had the same questions for our team. To your point, Alex, like, how was this not elevated? How was this not highlighted? How was this not made an absolute priority from 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 Satya Nadella all the way down, Brad Smith, everybody on the executive team, getting in a room, figuring this out, getting answers from the security team and the incident response folks. Drilling down as much as they could into this to understand it and be able to communicate it and to get firm answers. I, it's just it just doesn't seem like they took it all that seriously. So you have that coupled with the transparency and you're just like, what's going on here? Uh, mm -hmm. I don't, Ariel, I don't know. 
you have thoughts on it. Yeah, no, I mean, the transparency thing is the biggest issue to me. I feel like it's kind of lacking throughout the industry and Microsoft should kind of be doing better in the position that they're in and how many people they serve. And obviously, it's, it just feels like they didn't want to make themselves look bad that they didn't know what happened, kind of. So yeah. they chose not to say anything, <clears throat> which isn't isn't the right thing to do for customers. It's, it's weird. And then was it with... Uh, Alex, was it with Higgins or someone else where they were at, where he was asked about recall and some of the things there? And you know, did they apply? Recall was later. Secure by design. That was another thing that really got my my back up when it was it, whoever it was that asked Smith about. Well, did you apply secure by design practices to you know this particular feature or this particular product? It was. I I could I can jump in here. It was when. He was asked later about how Microsoft would incorporate secure by design into recall. Uh, Smith noted that the feature hadn't yet been released and that uh, we designed it so it's off by default, which that second part is factually inaccurate because we have we have uh, we have receipts that that's not true. Yeah. Um, and it was due to launch alongside the copilot PCs very soon, I think within days, um, basically. Yeah. Um, and after he and he said we have time to get it right, even though again it was days away. And then Microsoft ultimately made the call that very same day uh, to to delay recall. I asked Microsoft if there was a connection between the two. They never responded, which is which normally I I get like some sort of boilerplate comment, but I got nothing this time. I didn't get anything for my recall. Yeah, story, yeah. Like, this is an area they're not wanting to say much well mm -hmm. i would say these two things coupled uh not a great look for microsoft and i it's hard i think it's hard for anyone any impartial observer to look at the stuff that's gone on with the recall and the hearing and brad smith's testimony last week and come away feeling better about where microsoft is with security uh that's not to beat up on them you know, we're we're not turning this into a blood sport, but obviously Microsoft hugely important, and it just seems like they have a long, long way to go. Uh, how long? I don't know, but doesn't this doesn't instill a lot of confidence, uh, at least for us, and I, I imagine probably not a lot of enterprise customers. Who knows about consumers? Um, but. Uh, we should, we should probably end it there because we could go on forever and nitpick this uh, stuff. But I, I think we've covered the the highlights, the important stuff. Um, thank you guys for writing about these uh, these topics, these subject matters. Sub subjects matter? No, subject matters, right? Yeah, I know, subject I always get matters. That, I always get that <laughs> stuff confused. And, and any time. Listen, if I had more than two hours of sleep, I think I'd be doing a lot better um, with my with my words. But unfortunately, I, I did not. Uh, Alex, Ariel, thank you guys so much for covering this stuff and for getting on a podcast to discuss it further with us. No problem. Thanks, Rob. And thank you to the readers and listeners of Tech Target Security and the Risk and Repeat podcast. I'm Rob Wright, and we will see you next time.